categorized into five different types. Food establishment were only prepackaged, non-hazardous foods are prepared, come under risk category one. The food establishment were prepackaged raw ingredients are cooked or prepared with respect to the order. This come under risk type two. Here, food products, food is prepared and served immediately. So the, this preparation process require cooking, cooling and reheating are limited to one or two potentially hazardous foods. So this type of food establishment come under risk type two. Establishment which prepare food for next day service for uh, two or three items. Such establishments come under risk type 3. So they are preparing uh, mainly the foods which are served on the same day, but only one or two or three items are prepared for next day service. So such establishments come under risk type 3. Here, extensive handling of uh, raw materials are done, raw ingredients are done, and the preparation process includes cooking, cooling, and reheating of potentially hazardous foods. Now, in the establishments which come under risk type 4, food is usually prepared for next day service. All the food is for next day service. So, so such establishments come under risk type 4 category. Here also, Extensive handling of raw ingredients are done. Then preparation processes done in such establishment include cooking, cooling and reheating of potentially hazardous food. Now the risk type 5. Here most of the food produced are with extended shelf life. They, are kept, they can be kept for more time. So the, the, in such food establishment, foods when extended shelf life are produced, this comes under risk type 5. So based on the risk associated with uh, the food produced or the food processing, the food establishments are categorized into 5 types. So within all these types of food establishment, uh, retail food establishments, Five specific aspects of operations produce exposure to foodborne pathogens. There are five aspects of operations which can expose food to foodborne pathogens in all these in all these types of food establishment. These are food sourced from unsafe sources, inadequate cooking. Improper holding time or temperature, contaminated equipment, poor personal hygiene. So these are the five aspects which expose the food to foodborne pathogens. So control of these aspects of retail operations is essential to ensure food safety in retail sector. Some crucial practices in maintaining the food safety of required level in retail sector include the time and temperature controls, proper food storage conditions, training and certification of managers, cleaning and sanitation practices. These are some crucial practices for maintaining food safety in retail sector. So taking an example of a typical meat related retail organization, we can consider the key areas and associated aspects with respect to good retail practices. So we're taking an example of a meat retail organization, meat related retail organization. 
So these are the key areas. The first one is receiving area. So retailers should confirm that supplier has an effective program to prevent biological, physical or chemical hazards such as a HACCP system. So retailers should source the material from such approved sources. Shipping containers should have labels. Invoices, receipts and lot coding information should be kept to permit tracking of all the products if it is necessary. The trailers delivering meat products should be examined to ensure that they are suitable for food delivery. Incompatible cargo must not be present along with the food products. Products should be inspected for signs of contamination, damage to packaging or indications of temperature abuse. If such things are noticed, the cargo should be returned to origin or destroyed. Now, unloading procedures. The cargo should be inspected upon arrival to ensure that they have not become contaminated during transport. Meat products should not be unloaded in presence of sources of contamination. Perishable meat products should be moved promptly off the loading dock into refrigerated or frozen storage. And it should be ensured that adequate temperature control is maintained during unloading. Loading dock areas should be periodically cleaned. Birds, mice and other pests must be kept out of loading dock areas. Exterior garbage storage containers should be kept away from loading dock entrances. Now the storage. Now the second uh, area, key area is the storage area. So first we have seen the receiving area, now the storage area. The stored meat must be covered and protected from pests, dust, condensation or any other unsanitary condition. Ensure that all the boxes in coolers are not placed against a wall or directly on the floor because if the boxes are placed against the wall or directly on the floor, there will not be adequate space for air movement. So space between the product and cooler walls permits air flow and this will facilitate rapid cooling. So proper space should be there between the product boxes and the cooler walls. When air space between boxes and use of dividers between layers on a pallet is also useful. Now the storage temperature and shelf life. Fresh meat should be stored at no more than 4 degree Celsius. All the fresh meat should be stored at a temperature less than 4 degree Celsius. If possible, it should be kept at minus 1 degree to 2 degree Celsius. It should be kept at a temperature between minus 1 degree Celsius to 2 degree Celsius. Anyway, it should not cross the temperature limit of 4 degree Celsius. For frozen meat, temperature should be maintained at minus 18 degree Celsius. There should be a first in first out rotation system. This system is important to enable the customer to receive the freshest and safest product. Alarm system should be used to monitor the cooler temperature. When the temperature falls below the required limit, some alarm system should alert. If boxes show signs of significant warming, they should be inspected to determine suitability for use. 
So the main products which have spent significant time over a temperature of 4 degrees Celsius should be destroyed, should not be used. If the main product was uh, stored at a temperature of above 4 degrees Celsius for significant time, it should not be used, it should be destroyed. Ensure that volume and temperature of the product is not more than the refrigeration capacity. Now the third area is fabrication. Third area, key area in a meat retail organization is fabrication. So the packing for boards should be inspected for excessive scoring and scratching. And it should be replaced if necessary. Bins used for storage or transport must be of wood grain. All the surfaces must be free of corrosion, flaking paint or other condition which would prevent cleaning. During cut fabrication, muscles should be inspected for any defect that would seriously affect product use. If surfaces such as cutting boards, knives or other equipment have been exposed to contaminated product, they must be cleaned and sanitized immediately. In the event that product is dropped on the floor or contacts any other unclean surface, it should be destroyed. It should not be used again. It should be destroyed. Cutting board should be cleaned on a periodic basis throughout the day. All cleaning activities should be performed using only approved chemicals. Chemicals should be stored away from food contact items. When cleaning, be sure, when cleaning, be sure to have all packing materials, ingredients and meat products covered as the chemicals will contaminate these products. Now, employee hygiene. Any sores or cuts must be covered with dry, tight-fitting bandages and gloves worn when hands are affected. Usually, such employees should not be allowed to participate in food operations, but if there is a situation that they should be allowed to work. In that case, all the cuts must be covered with dry, tight-fitting bandages and gloves should be use, used. Employees must wash their hands immediately following sneezing, using washroom, uh, following coffee lunch breaks, etc. Hair nets and beard nets should be used. Now the fourth area is grinding. Ground meat and trim should be stored at 4 degrees Celsius or lower in bins. Short trimming should be labeled with production date and species. Ingredient selection and preparation. Select meat ingredients in accordance with the principle of first in, first out. Inspect meat for off order, excess purge, bond sheets, cartilage, torn, or rip packaging, or any other condition which would make the ground meat or trim and satisfactory for use. Make certain that grinder is free of excessive rust, water, flaking paint or other condition which could contaminate the product. Ensure that grinder has been cleaned adequately and is free of visible meat residue. While grinding the meat, it should be ensured that only what is required in the next few hours is ground. Not more than that. Ground meat in areas where room temperature is not more than 10 degrees Celsius or whenever possible 4 degrees Celsius of coldness. So, you, 
So try to grind the meat in areas where temperature is 4 degrees Celsius or lower. If ground meat is more than one can sell in a day, it should be kept immediately freeze. It should be kept immediately in a freezer. Grinder sanitation. Completely disassemble, clean and sanitize grinder after each day of production. Complete cleanup must be undertaken when switching on to another species. Now the fifth area is sausage. To prevent the growth of bacteria during storage, natural casing should be salted or kept in brine at 4 degrees Celsius or lower in covered containers. Spices and seasoning should be stored, covered and be protected from humidity, pest and clean cleaning chemicals. Ingredient selection and preparation. Insect natural case, inspect natural casings to ensure that they are relatively free of patches or spongy tissue. If ice is used in sausage production, ensure that ice box is cleaned regularly and that only clean scoops are used to remove it. Inspect the meat for off order, bond chips, cartilage, glands, foreign materials or any other condition which would make it unsatisfactory for use. Pre-operational inspection. Before the start of production, all equipment should be inspected to ensure that it is free of visible meat residues or pooled water and that all parts and parts and pastas are accounted for and properly secured. The sausage production area should be kept at 4 degrees Celsius or colder. If potential allergens are used in the production of sausage, ensure that they are declared in the label of that product or in the ingredient list. Now there is a sixth area in a meat retail unit is processing. Select meat ingredients on the basis of first in first out system. All meat materials should be kept covered free of any potential contamination and at 4 degrees Celsius or less. Whenever possible, tumble meat at 4 degrees Celsius or colder to enhance food safety, shelf life, slice stability and yield. Clean and sanitize the tumbler between batches. Inspect the tumbler daily before production for corrosion, damage or loose components. Now the coating of sausage. In coating of the material. So apply all the coatings in a single use method. Place only the required amount of coating material on a clean working surface. And after the coating is completed, throw away all unused ingredients. It should not be used for next day. So after the completion of coating, the unused ingredients should be thrown away. Now marinating. Do not reuse marinades. Conduct marinating activities at 4 degrees Celsius or colder. The stuffing of meat. Do not reuse any stuffing material and prepare stuffing immediately before use only. The mechanical tentering or injecting. Clean and sanitize injecting or tenterizing equipment between the batches of the product. Inspect needles or blades before production and after each batch to ensure proper function. Now allergen control. If potential allergens are used in the production of processed products, ensure that they are declared in the labels or ingredient list and the equipment should be cleaned before the other products are made. 
the packaging of meat in a retail unit. Packaging storage. As food packaging contacts product directly, it must always be kept clean, covered and free of any potential contamination. Packing must never be stored in the same area where the chemicals are kept. The packaging employees must wash their hands immediately following sneezing, using washroom, etc. Hair nets and beard nets must be recommended. When packaging, ensure that wrap or bag is tight and maintain an effective seal which will not permit leakage. If clips or other fasteners are used, then special care is needed to ensure that they do not enter the food product. Placing meat on trays. When placing cut meat on trays, be aware of the potential for contamination which can result from stacking the tray on top of the meat surface of the tray beneath it. So that should be taken into account when placing the tray one tray on the other. Tray and rack placement. When trays and racks are placed in a location to avoid unloading, ensure that they are kept in refrigerated areas. If metal trays are used for storage of meat, it should be cleaned and sanitized after each use. Now display of material or the meat product in a retail unit. A retail procedure for cleaning the display cases must be in place. It should contain a schedule for cleaning. Display K maintenance. When maintenance is required, it is essential that food product contained in the case be removed or radically protected against contamination or a rise in temperature. Temperature measurement devices within the display case should be periodically checked. To ensure the shelf life and safety, temperature of display cases should be monitored at least three times per day. For optimal display, fresh meat should be maintained between 0 and 2 degrees Celsius and frozen meat should be kept at minus 18 degrees Celsius in frozen case. In the event of any refrigeration system failure, products should be inspected and make sure and uh, it should be inspected to see that whether the product temperature has exceeded 4 degrees Celsius for a significant period of time. So in that case, the main product should be disposed of. Inventory rotation. Product must be removed from storage and put on display in accordance with first in first out program. And it is to be ensured that any outdated product is not placed on display. When possible, a sign explaining the package done and best before date should be posted on the product. Periodic inspection of the display case should be performed to ensure there are no leaking or damaged packaging. It is also important to make certain that all labels are still present on package and are readable. So these are some of the good retail practices in a meat related retail organization. Now let us see good transport practices. In designing of good transport practices, some questions are to be considered. 
These are, is the food ready for direct consumption? Are the conditions of the food transportation unit likely to introduce or support the increase of a hazard? Is it likely that a hazard is introduced or increased during loading of the product? Is it likely that a hazard may increase during transport or storage in the food transportation unit? Is it likely that a hazard is introduced or increased during unloading? So all these questions are to be considered during the design of good transport practices. So according to this, so the practices should be, good practices should be devised. So hazards to food arising from transportation can be categorized into three. These are hazards related to the food transportation unit itself. That is unsuitability of the construction material and coating, lack of sealing, locking device, etc. of the transportation unit. This can cause hazard. Residues of previous cargo, residue from cleaning and sanitizing materials, etc. can act as hazards which are introduced into the food from food transportation unit. Now hazards related to loading and unloading. Increase or decrease of temperature of the food during loading or unloading can happen. So this will, this will cause some food safety hazard. Then undesirable introduction of microbes, dust, moisture or other physical contamination during loading or unloading. Now the third type of hazards associated is related to transport. During transport, leakage of heating or cooling fluid may happen. So this will affect the temperature of the product and that can be a cause to hazard. So breakdown of temperature control may happen during transport. So these are some of the hazards associated with transportation loading, unloading, transportation and the transportation unit itself. So while devising the good transport practices, all these hazards are to be taken into consideration. Now the design of food transportation unit. Construction and design of the construction and design of food transportation units should facilitate inspection cleaning, disinfection and it should enable temperature control. Use of means for cooling or heating should be designed and constructed such as to avoid contamination. In the surface of the transportation unit should be made of materials which are suitable for direct food contact. Stainless steel or surface coated with food grain epoxy resins are most suitable for this purpose. Now dedicated transport should be used for transporting food. So where appropriate, bulk transport containers and conveyance should be designated and marked for food use only and be used only for that purpose. So transportation units should be used, if these units are used for food transportation, it should be used only for that purpose, it should not be used for transporting other items. Now the documentation and records. Suitable controls can be formulated by shippers or receivers to ensure food safety during transport. Such control should be communicated in writing and documentation is an important tool for validation and for verification. Now, transportation spills and salvage. All potentially hazard food that have been subjected to temperature abuse must be discarded in such a fashion that 
precludes the food item from being utilized for human consumption. Can the packaged goods that has compromised the integrity of package should be discarded? All foods that are being subjected to contamination by exposure to chemicals or other contaminants must be discarded in such a fashion that prevent the food from being utilized for human consumption. Any food that are salvageable shall be kept in secure storage until approved for salvage and resale by the regulatory authority. Now the temperature controls. Food requiring temperature control shall be transported in a manner that prevents temperature abuse. Food requiring refrigeration shall be transported at 4 degrees Celsius or less. So mechanical refrigeration is mandatory for long distance transport. Whenever chill foods are received with a product temperature of plus 7 degrees Celsius or higher or frozen in error, the manufacturer shall be notified immediately and special handling instruction will be requested. Frozen food should be transported at a temperature of minus 18 degrees Celsius or less throughout the loading or movement. Food that may be damaged by freezing should be transported at a temperature of 0 degrees Celsius or higher. Air temperatures within temperature control transportation units should be regularly monitored. For a refrigerated transport trailer, shipment must be properly loaded, ensuring adequate air circulation around the lock. For food requiring refrigeration, it should be at 4 degrees Celsius or lower prior to loading in the transportation unit and it must be 4 degrees Celsius or lower once delivered to the receiver. So these are some of the good transportation practices to ensure food safety. Now let us see nutritional labeling. So what is the need for nutritional labeling? The consumers are exposed to a whole range of processed foods every day. So same type of food may be supplied by different manufacturers. So it is the nutrition labeling which helps the consumers to compare different products of same nature. Codex has published guidelines on nutritional labeling. To ensure, so these guidelines are published to ensure that nutritional labeling is effective in providing the consumer with information about their food so that a wise choice of food can be made in providing a means for conveying information of nutrient content of a food on label in encouraging the use of sound nutrition principles in the formulation of food which would benefit public health in providing the opportunity to include supplementary nutrition information to ensure that nutrition labeling does not describe a product or present information about which about it which is in a way false or misleading deceptive or insignificant to ensure that no nutritional claims are made without nutrition labeling so the, the products guidelines are published to ensure these aspects the consumer should be given information about the nutrients present in that food so that they can make a wise choice of food and they will get information of all the nutrient content. Nutrient declaration. So the information supply should be for the purpose of providing consumers with a suitable profile of nutrients contained in the food and considered to be of nutrition importance. And the content of supplementary nutrition information will vary from one country to another and within any country from one target population group to another. 
the nutrition labeling should not deliberate, deliberately imply that a food which carries such labeling has necessarily any nutritional advantage over a food which is not so labeled. So one food may be uh, labeled and the other food may be unlabeled. But nutrition labeling should not imply that that labeled food is superior to the other one. The labeling should be only to provide information to the customer, not to compare with the other product. There should not, there should not be anything which compares one product with the other one. The comparison should be done by the consumer only. The information usually appears on a nutrition label includes, these are given under the title nutrition facts. So these include information on total calorie or the energy of provided by the food, calories from fat, calories from saturated fat, total fat, saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, monounsaturated fat, cholesterol, sodium, potassium, total carbohydrate, dietary fiber, soluble fiber, insoluble fiber, sugar, added sugar, trans fat, sugar alcohol, protein, vitamin A, vitamin C, calcium, iron, and other essential vitamins and minerals. So these informations can be given under the title nutrition facts. So here is an example for a nutrition panel, nutrition panel or a nutrition label. This is an example for the nutritional fat label devised by US FDA. So you can see that in this label, calorie of a particular food is mentioned, total fat, saturated fat, trans fat, cholesterol, sodium, carbohydrate, dietary fiber, total sugar. So the information on all these nutrients are will be there in this nutrition label. Also, the nutrients are declared as percentage of daily value. Here you can see the percentage of daily value. So here you can see the amount of total fat or saturated fat etc in grams, cholesterol, sodium etc in milligrams on this label and on the right side you can see percentage daily value. So declaring the nutrients as a percentage daily value is intended to prevent the misinterpretations that arise from quantitative value because here the quantitative value is 8 gram. Total fat of quantity, uh, the value is given as 8 grams. So you may think that it's only 8 grams is the, so the product is uh, containing low fat. But it, this is providing about 10 percentage of fat required daily. And here you can see this product contains added sugar 10 grams. Only 10 grams is the, but if you look at the percentage daily value, this particular product is giving 20 percentage of added sugar required in a day. Similarly, this particular product provides 45 percentage of iron required in a day. It contains only 8 milligram of iron, but it provides around 8 45 percentage of iron required in a day. In the case of uh, potassium, this is 240 milligram and it provides 6 percentage. Sodium, this particular product provides 160 milligram and this accounts for 7 percentage of sodium required daily. Yes, the, the daily required amount of sodium is 2400 milligram. So this particular product is giving 160 milligram. That means if you consume this particular product, it will provide seven percentage of sodium required in a day. So that is the meaning of percentage daily value. So this is based on a 2000 calorie diet. If a, 2000, if a person is taking a diet, a daily diet containing 2000 calories, what is the percentage provided by this particular product? That is shown here. So this is a nutritional panel format. This is according to US FDA. And as per FSSA, 
these are the information mandatory informations to be given on nutritional label that is energy value or the calorie protein carbohydrate total sugar added sugar total fat saturated fat trans fat cholesterol then sodium so the level of this nutrients around 10 nutrients should be given on nutrition level as per fssa which is the food safety act in india now let us see the traceability iso defines traceability as ability to trace the history application or loca location of an entity which is under consideration so traceability is the ability to trace the history application or location of an entity which is under consideration so traceability may refer to the origin of materials and parts the processing history and distribution and location of product after delivery so traceability is closely linked with product identification there are three dimensions of a traceability system that is breadth depth and precision so breadth describes the amount of information a traceability system records how much information how is recorded by a traceability system that is described by breadth of that system now the depth of a traceability system is how far back or forward the system tracks how far the system tracks both back and forward that is the depth of a traceability system and the precision of a traceability system reflects the degree of assurance with which tracing system can pinpoint a particular food products movement of characteristics so how exactly it can pinpoint a products movement of characteristics that is reflected by precision of a traceability system The factors influencing the benefits of a traceability system are value of coordination along the supply chain, market size, value of the food product, likelihood of safety or quality failures, magnitude of penalty. These are the factors influencing the benefits of a traceability system. Usually the traceability system is benefited when there is a safety or quality failure and there is a need for withdrawing a product or recalling a product then traceability helps if we can trace back the product we can or trace forward the product we can recall that product easily so for that a traceability system must be in place now the factors influencing the cost of a traceability system include the breadth of traceability the depth and number of transactions the precision size and exacting nature of the tracking units degree of product transformation complexity of the system new segregation or identity preservation of activities new accounting systems and procedures and technological difficulties of tracking all these influence the cost of implementing traceability system now what is why a traceability system is needed in a food business so in addition to meeting the regulatory demands a traceability system has three main roles in a food business to provide information within the business to assist in process control and management and assist when a problem arises that means the traceability systems are important to support effective withdrawal or recall of products now to help to support the claims about the product and provide information to consumers so these are the main roles of a traceability system in a food business 
Now the key traceability steps in manufacturing process. First one, when goods are received. At this point, the records form a critical traceability link. A proper record should be there to maintain a traceability system. So records for from whom the goods are received, the name and address of the supplier and the transporter, when the material is received, that is the date and time of this receipt of the material, what exactly is received, that is the identity of food or feed and the quantity of receipt. And what is done with the goods after receipt, whether it is stored uh, separately or whether it is mixed with some other lot, that should be kept in record. Now, inside a food or food feed business, the record should be kept for the ingredients used for the production of food. So, a record should be there for ingredients. Then, the keeping a note of the date and time of the production of the food. Then, product identification. A batch number or lot number should be given for the product. So, all these are required for the traceability in, inside a food or feed business. Then, when goods are dispatched, record should be kept for to whom? The material is, the food product is dispatched and the destination of the product. An identity on quantity of the goods that is supplied. The date and time when the goods were dispatched and received. Record should be there for all these things. So these are must for implementing a traceability system. So how long to keep these records? So all these traceability records should be kept for a minimum period. Usually, we should consider the shelf life of the product. It should be kept till the shelf life of the product is expired. Now the limitations of implementing a traceability tool. In countries, where the products, raw material, ingredients and components are produced by small and medium enterprises or in a cooperative structure or are procured through market systems in smaller volumes, there the backward identification of the product becomes difficult. And where the raw material, ingredient or components are inseparable, tracing to its source is impractical. And in some developing countries, due to small farm holdings, farm production is in very small volumes. So marketable volumes are built up at collection centers before being taken to a packing house or processing center. So the material, raw material is not sourced from a single supplier. See, these are collected in collector centers and then handed over to a packing house or processing center. So in such situations, tracing is possible only up to the stage of packing house, not to the farmer. So these are some of the limitations in implementing traceability. Some of the alternatives to traceability are, at the primary level, group farming with an internal control system and record keeping can be a feasible alternative to a traceability system. Food safety controls through hazard, GMP, etc., including checks of contaminants and appropriate labeling of batch load numbers with expiry dates, can take into account the concerns of traceability needs. The management of non conformities pointed out by food safety experts should be done, as well as the regular training of manpower involved in the production process. This can act as an alternative tool. Regular documentation of inputs and practices followed in production system that facilitates the identification of possible reasons of contamination in food. So application of all these alternatives will depend upon the nature and extent of risk involved in a 
in the production of food. Now the recommended steps for application of traceability. In the context of food import and export inspection and certification system. So what are the recommended steps in this context? Import and export uh, certification system. Here, the identification and communication of objectives and scope of traceability is done by the importing country and it is communicated to the exporting country. Identification and communication of what is to be traced that must be done by the exporting country, uh, by the importing country. Provide information to the exporting country about possible causes of the risk, nature and extent of risk and assessment of risk by not applying the traceability tool. The importing country should suggest possible cost-effective alternative equivalent measures to address the risk concerns without the use of traceability tool. The importing country should also take into account that when a traceability tool is to be implemented, that traceability tool should be transparent, practical, technically feasible and economically viable and it should not be more trade restrictive than necessary. The extent of application of traceability in food chain should be established. Application of traceability tool should adequately address the needs of developing countries and their traditional practices. The exporting country should be able to establish that alternative measures selected for application would appropriately address the risk concerns of importing country without the need for application of a traceability tool. So these are some of the recommended steps in the context of food import and export inspection and certification system. So it should be taken bear in mind that the traceability is, is only a tool for establishment of product authenticity, reliability, identification of problem areas for the purpose of tracking and product code. So it is only for this, traceability is only for this. But food safety can be ensured only with the implementation of appropriate practices like good agricultural practice, good manufacturing practice, good handling practice, good transport practice, uh, systems like HSCCP, ISO 22000, etc. So implementing such systems can ensure safety and implementing traceability system should facilitate if a problem arises for the purpose of tracking and product record. So, these are the topics for today. So, I think we can stop now. Thank you all.